We're going to continue on with Romans chapter 9. Uh, last week, uh, we started reading Romans 9 from verse 1 to 29. And uh, you all agree with me uh, if you follow through the study that it is a very, very challenging chapter. And no wonder people call it blink theology. We love to read uh, Romans from 1 to 8. And then we blink and we wake up uh, in Romans chapter 12 and continue on. But in between, we really jump over uh, because it is very offensive to human mind as well as it actually, uh, uh, the concept there, Apostle Paul is not, I guess, uh, trying to appeal to us as much as really deal with the, uh, the truth of God's faithfulness and the reasons. Uh, of Israel, uh, really this uh, question of Romans 9, uh, 10, and 11, uh, these three chapters have been very much overlooked from the time of Reformation. Remo Reformation really visited Romans 1 to 8 to see how a man gets saved, but uh, what the gospel is. 9 to 11 has not really been given the same amount of intensity uh, because um, it just just uh, poses a lot of difficulties. Even today, when you go to church, you will find different positions from Romans 9 to 11. So I guess, I excuse me, because I'm not going to read through uh, Romans 9 uh, up to verse 29 again. And unfortunately, because of the time, I had to stop um, and then uh, sort of um, uh, couldn't finish, uh, you know, the uh, latter part of uh, Romans 9. So I'm hoping to do that. But uh, at this point, I like to take a little bit of time and uh, just uh, revisit and question. I'm going to answer some question: Who is Israel and who is church? And many of you know the, uh, the answer. But I think taking us through the reason why this is so important, uh, I like us to be able to, I guess, uh, grasp a bit, bit more. I like to call Romans 9 to 11 uh, the link between Old Testament prophetic history and the New Testament prophetic theology. It's actually, there's more in here. And because we don't pay attention to what Paul is saying, and we don't really understand and grasp importance of what Paul is saying in Romans 9, that we do not know how to lay hold of Old Testament prophetic passages. It really don't have the right kind of uh, context. So, um, um, let me just uh, broadly categorize uh, Christian thinking because when you read Old Testament, all the prophets have spoken about the blessing and curse and the future of Israel. Usually there is a lot of judgment on Israel along with the promises of blessings, but always ends up with God restoring Israel's glory. And then we come into New Testament, most of Christians, us Christians, we start with Jesus. So that uh, Israel is not very relevant to us with Jesus and salvation. And then where does Israel fit? Uh, we really don't know how to fit it. And then uh, we actually, uh, this is a, a big, big implication. So when it comes to all the testament, all the promises of God's blessing, future blessing, to Israel is concerned, generally we take one of the three positions. First position is that, well, God's promise to Israel failed. Why? Because Israel broke the covenant. So all the promises that God spoke from Moses all the way to the prophets, it's no longer valid because Israel broke the covenant. So that's divorce. That's the end of the matter. So uh, the word of God, then all the blessing, all the promises to Israel will not be fulfilled. That's their position. Uh, last week, we uh, had Paul is asking three questions. First one is, has the word of God failed towards the blessing towards uh, Israel? And the answer is, of course not. So that obviously is not the way that Apostle Paul see it. 
right? Um, the second one uh, is that uh, second position is, okay, Israel failed, but you know what? God's word cannot fail because word of God is absolutely solid. So uh, how a lot of churches teach and take is that the word of God's blessing for Israel is being fulfilled by the church. God's blessing for the church is fulfilling God's original promise of blessing to Israel. So it is being, uh, uh, that's why it's called replacement theology, because all the blessings God promised to Israel, church now has replaced it. So God's word is still being fulfilled, but it is no longer to the Jews, children of Abraham. It is now transferred to church. So church, through church, God's word is being fulfilled. So there is a lot of emphasis on Christ and Christ's first coming, what Jesus has done, so that through the cross, all the blessings flow out to the nations of the world, including Jews, and uh, that's, that's uh, how it is being fulfilled, typologically or, or you know, uh, spiritually, all the promises being fulfilled. So the uh, problem, it's, you know, uh, many of the things are quite beautiful and absolutely right. Uh, usually the weakness there is that when you ask them, so, uh, you know, why is Jesus coming back? Most people don't really have a clear understanding of why Jesus is coming back. Uh, because everything is being done on the cross. Jesus' first coming is the center. But the second coming is not very clear. Why he has to come back? Uh, what's going to happen in the end time, all that is very fuzzy, very fuzzy. You ask them, people who hold that position, ask them, so what does God say, the word of God say about the end time? The Bible has 150 chapters devoted to it, and a very clear prophetic history yet to be fulfilled in the future. It is very hazy because of the mindset, and the, uh, it just, you just can't, because that's the grasp. Of course, the third one is then, all right, the word of God towards uh, the blessing towards Israel still remains largely the future event that will be fulfilled to the letter as it has originally been given. We haven't reached there yet, so we are going there, but God is faithful. All of that will literally be fulfilled by the physical Israel, Jews. That's the third position, and usually people who uh, say that has a great interest in what the Bible has to say about Jesus' second time, where a lot of these promises will be squashed and will be fulfilled. In fact, uh, we read that uh, scripture uh, last week. I'm hopefully going to refer to that. God says he will do his quick work on earth in the last days on Israel and all the world what God had predicted through the prophets about the events of the future and part of that is also God's promise of blessing to the Jews will also be fulfilled to the letter but it hasn't happened yet but it's, uh, it's coming, it's very close that's the view, obviously you know, you know where I stand. <laughs> we all know, I believe we all stand uh, very clearly. Obviously, it's the third one. Second one has a great deal of truth to it, but it's not complete. It's missing something, right? And um, um, so I want to uh, obviously uh, address that today because with that is a very important question. Who is Israel and who is the church? Incidentally, people who have that replacement theology or the church has replaced Israel, uh, it's funny that, you know, all the Old Testament blessings towards Israel, we're very happy to take it as church. But all the curses and all the punishment due to disobedience, we don't want to touch it. You know, in Jesus, it's all dissolved. We can take the blessing, but push it out curse. It's all happening. It's all observed by Jews because they were disobedient. But we, the church, we, we can just observe the blessing. Isn't that funny how we can take part of it and uh, not take the other part? If you're not take the whole thing, take the whole thing. 
And it's a very interesting observation as well. You reject the whole thing and take the whole thing. You can't just take part, only you know, uh, good bits and then reject the uh, bad bits. Somebody said that, you know, Israel had 2,000 years of history as a nation. Church has 2,000 years of history. And uh, somebody said, it would be a very close contest between the two who has been more disobedient to the word of God. <laughs> Yet we are saying, you know, we've been, we, we take all the blessing, but we can actually get away. Well, not so. In fact, you know, this teaching from 9 to 11 about the prophetic destiny of Israel is more than Israel. It's actually God's ways of dealing with his people. And as you saw last week, it smashes, shatters, absolutely, humanism, human ego. It's grounded to the zeal. We cannot survive. Yet, there's such a humanistic theology. And that humanistic theology gets offended at chapter 9 and cannot get beyond it. So, you know, you try to read through, work through chapter, you know, up to 8. Chapter 9, you hit the rock. You cannot move anymore. <laughs> it's so offensive. You cannot process it. So you just jump over, jump all the way up and land in chapter 12 and move on. It's acceptable. So chapter 9, 10, and 11 is a bedrock, actually, to see the link between 11 to 12. Um, and uh, that actually is more than uh, a link between Romans 8 to Romans 12. It is also a link, as I said, between the Old Testament prophetic theology to the New Testament, you know, uh, um, uh, destiny. And uh, there's the same principle of God's dealings with church as well that runs right through the theme. So uh, I hope I'm kind of explaining this so that we can... Um, um, uh, start, but uh, can I just uh, uh, just uh, tell you a bit more? You know uh, this thing called replacement theology in the 70 A.D. as the temple in Jerusalem got destroyed and Jews were since then scattered to over 120 nations. Um, something that happened in the church is that uh, even as uh, you know early as uh, Justin Mara, uh, early church fathers like you know. Um, very early on, like, you know, uh, 200, 300 years uh, AD and so on, uh, right through. On the Western side, particularly, there has been a systematic um, a plan almost to obliterate a place of Jews in the covenant of God. And that uh, attitude actually comes through over and over again uh, to the point that uh, later on, the term called the New Israel has been uh, introduced. But when you look at the, I challenge you to read through the New Testament, you will not find that term, New Israel. No apostle has ever used the term New Israel. Israel is Israel, and the church is church. Now, Jews can also be part of the church. In fact, the majority of the church members in the early days were Jews. So uh, Romans has been written with two problems. One is theological problem, the other one is practical problem. Theological problem is now from Romans chapter 1 to 8, Paul said, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And God's grace, God's election, you know, God's, you know, predestination, God's love, you know, uh, all of that, God is taking care of you. He loves you. Nothing can shake you out of his hand. And then, okay, then what happened to the Jews? Practical problem is that, that you know, the Roman church was founded by Jews. And then because Jews were all expelled from uh, Rome, they were all expelled. That they, they built the church, they bought the church, they had the leadership of the church, they were all expelled out of the city. Uh, three, four years later, they came back all the church is now occupied by Gentiles. Pastor is now Gentile. All the elders, four of the elders, all Gentile. Jews come back, back to the leadership, but it's all taken over. So now there is a real issue. Then why is this happening? 
most of the Christians in Rome are now Gentiles. Jews are coming back to find that they have been replaced. <laughs> Why then? So uh, Romans 9 really opens up. Uh, it follows the three questions, right? Paul is saying, has the word of God failed? No, it hasn't failed at all. In fact, God's word always follows through the remnant, remnant of chosen believers. God makes a choice. It's God's choice that is more important. And the last week I gave you all the reason uh, of, from human point of view, you know, um, God always responds to us as well. Uh, it's not God's choice. It's not uh, taking a, a, you know, a lot out of the head. It's not la Sarah, Sarah. You know, that is not that. Uh, God does respond to us. But God makes choice, and his choice is always right. And he chooses in response to our response as well. Okay, Now, um, there are 79 times in the Bible, in the New Testament, the uh, Bible uses the word Israel 79 times. I've gone through every one of them. Not one of them refers to church. Not one. So, um, so it's completely a new concept to say that the church replaced Israel. Now, Israel in the New Testament is a type of a church, but it's never a synonym. Never. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just leave it at that. I can actually get in a lot more, but I'll just leave it at that. Uh, so when um, Paul says, not all Israel is Israel, that's from last week. He's not saying uh, Christians are now true Israel. He's not saying that. What he's saying is that out of Israel, uh, the Jewish people, the children of Abraham, not all of them actually receive spiritual inheritance. So he's making true Israel more exclusive within people of Israel, though also have the promise by faith, are the true Israel, their remnant. So through them, God's blessing passes on, God fulfills uh, his plans, okay? So um, now, let me ask, well, just uh, answer. See, what are the three problems of replacement theology, apart from the fact that you cannot have a clear vision of the Old Testament, nor can you have clear vision of the end time. If you can't make a history, biblical history, and if you can't follow you know, uh, the theme through the biblical history in a clear, logical way, there is no way you can actually see uh, the future clearly. So this is very, very important lens. So it really gives us clarity in the future. That's why, because we don't have this Israel right, we got so many uh, versions of the end time. So anyway, three consequences I'll just give you. It, number one, discredits reliability of the scripture. When you say God says he will do this, he will fulfill this, God has already committed to it, and he will say he will restore Israel. And when we don't, what happens? It makes mockery of God's word. God's word is not reliable. But God's word is absolutely literal, absolutely reliable. Amen. The second question is that if we don't, um, uh, if we have replacement understanding, it discredits the faithfulness of God, isn't it? We can say that God's word is fulfilled not in the way that it was given, but you know, in a spiritual sort of strange, like you know, spiritual uh, sideways. God will not fulfill it this way, so you will just change the original meaning to something else. So it actually discredits faithfulness of God. But what is Paul saying? Paul is saying God is absolutely faithful. He will do it. And then the third one is that it undermines the security of the church. If God could just replace Israel because Israel is not faithful, what makes us think that God will not replace the church when we are not faithful? And in fact, God talks about in the book of Revelation, the church is actually very unfaithful. So God brings, what? Uh, discipline. Five out of seven churches gets discipline, but they are never disowned. 
by God. I say hallelujah. You know, even when we are struggling and not faithful, God doesn't disown his church just as much as he doesn't disown Israel. God's promise is absolutely steady. That's where our steady, our confidence comes from. God's covenant with church is undissolvable. Hallelujah. Amen. That's where we get our security. If God can promise by oath to bless Israel and to save, and he just changed his mind because Israel is really bad, then, well, why shouldn't God change his mind about church and bring something else? Call something else. But he will not do that. He will be faithful. And church is the bride of Christ. Church made up of both Jews and Gentiles in Christ. Ah, the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. So we can have absolute confidence in God's faithfulness and God's um, covenant and the call to be the bride of Christ, which is the highest. Highest. We will never lose that. We can disqualify personally, but the church will ultimately be what God calls church to be. So stay in church. Never get out of church. Never jump out of church. Church is the bride of Christ. Amen. The covenant is given uh, to the church. So it's so important. Even though church failed, we are not what we should be. But never stay out of church. That's where the covenant remains. You know, the Jews that have uh, left Israel after the exile, after God's judgment, Two million Jews. Uh, I'm just sorry, I'm actually going all over the place. I haven't planned to say all this. But uh, two million Jews have gone exile. There were two million Jews who were in Babylon. You know how many came back? Only 50,000. 0.25%. But through that, 2.5% of the remnant of Jews that came back to Israel, God carries out his plan and purposes. His eternal plan moves through. What about the church? I'm not saying church is perfect and wonderful, but God's plan and purpose will carry on through the remnant of the church. And he's dealing with Israel with the same as his dealings with the church. That's why we need to fear God. Fear God and learn to reverence God and reverence his word. Amen. I think uh, somebody said, uh, you know, uh, his dealings with church history, his dealings with Israel, he's learned, uh, you know, um, to, um, to fear God. You know, Apostle Paul says, uh, Behold both the goodness and severity of God. Where do you find severity of God? Look at the history of Israel. In the Bible, only about 100 years, less than 100, about 70 years of church history is all we've got. You know, uh, we've got rich theology in the New Testament, but we don't have a lot of history of the ways of God and how it worked out in the church. We do have a church history to look at, but it's not authorized, not inspired uh, prophetic view of the church history. But what do we, where, where do we see the ways of God? Moses prayed, you know, teach me the ways of God, ways of, you want to know the ways of God so that you may gain a heart of wisdom. See, you have limited understanding of the ways of God through church history. What do you look at? Look at Israel. They have 2,000 years of inspired history interpreted through prophetic eyes. And the way, look at ways of how God deals with Israel, even in the modern history, according to God's prophetic word. See, God is very precise. He means what he says. He does. He does what he says. And when God speaks judgment, it's very real. As much the blessing is real, the judgment of God is also real. real. Very real. Amen. So um, it's such an important uh, part of the teaching in the Word of God. So the question, one was, is God unjust? Of course not. 
In fact, who are you? <laughs> Paul is saying, God is never unjust, right? And then Paul asks the second question, God, uh, you know, um, um, uh, where is it? Uh, chapter 9, you know, he says, uh, is God unjust? No, never. Uh, he, uh, that, uh, did God's uh, word fail? He says, no. Second question, is God unjust? Never. In fact, who are you to ask God's injustice? In fact, the one who asks whether God is unjust, you have no idea who God is. Yeah? God is absolutely just. In fact, it is not about justice of God, it's about mercy of God. Because if God gave justice to everybody, we will all be finished. It's about the mercy of God. It's his right to dispense his mercy. And then uh, the third question is, why does he then still find fault? Well, we are always responsible for our actions. Always responsible for what we do. So, uh, chapter 9, let me just uh, go through the rest of chapter 9, and I'm hoping to get through the chapter 10, but I don't think so. Uh, looking at the time, I'm so sorry. But uh, looking at the chapter 9, let me just go through, maybe we'll just go through chapter 9, uh, verse 25, because I actually stopped here. And Paul is saying, no, no, we are responsible. Because, you know, uh, God responds to us. And uh, um, Paul is now talking about Israel, verse 20, uh, 24 and 25. Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Okay? He's saying, he's saying that all of us have been used by God. Some will be used by God as a warning of God's justice. Some will be used as example of God's glory. He's saying the choice is up to us. <laughs> uh, but all of us will be used by God. But we all want to be used by, God's, uh, by God as God's uh, vessel of glory. Amen? And that's what we are being called to. We are absolutely called to as church. All right, uh, verse 25. He so also says in Hosea, I will call them but my people who are not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called the sons of the living God. Ooh. He's saying, um, so Paul is now looking ahead and looking back. He is, this is the bridge, see? God said, you are not my people. Where? In the land of Israel. Before the judgment of God came and swept them all away. God sent Hosea, prophet Hosea to Israel because they are keep on this, you know, um, uh, keep, you know, a breaking God's law. And God is saying that you are, you know, did you know that Hosea was actually told to marry a harlot so that he can feel what it feels like to be God, to see his heart broken over and over again. Yet God says, return to me. You're playing harlot, harlot all over the place, but I still want you. I want you to turn back. If you don't, judgment of, of God will come and God will say, you are going to be called not my people. But God, in his grace, doesn't finish there. He says, the place where I called you, you are not my people. Guess what? You will be called my people. That's the future. Now, where is this place where God called them not my people? So there's only one place that answers this description. Where is it? The land of Israel, where they call, you know, Canaan, or some people call it Palestine. It's not Palestine. It's the land of Israel, because God gave that title deed to Israel. And uh, there is no, it is no accident after 1900 years, Jews have come back to their place. Why? Because it's God's word. God says, I take you all out. But God says, I'll bring you back. In fact, do you know, it's actually written in the law of Moses. When you look at Leviticus chapter 26, you can look at it later. And then um, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Those two chapters are terms of God's covenant. God actually got Israel before they enter into the promised land. Okay, you, that's the promised land. When you go in there, God says uh, through Deuteronomy, says uh, Deuteronomy means the second law. God had given the same law twice before they enter in. You go into this place and half of you stand on Mount, you know, um, uh, you know uh, two sides of the Mount, um, you know, 
and then there is a deep valley. On the one side, you pronounce blessing. On the other side, you pronounce curse. If you uh, obey God's law, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you'll be cursed. So they all heard each other, blessing and curse. And God says, this day, choose blessing. So God says, you know, uh, if you follow my law, you'll be blessed. Verse 14 verses. And from verse 15 all the way to 40 something, all the way, rest of the chapter says, if you don't, these are the consequences. And the very last uh, thing is that if you still don't repent, God says, I'm, the last thing I'll do is that I'll actually take you, uh, kick you all out of my land. But that's not the end. He says, wherever you are scattered, when you remember God and turn back to God, I will bring you back to the land that I've given to Abraham. And there I'll restore you. So that was the term of the terms of the covenant in the very first day. Even from the days of Moses. Israel's history is that God's covenant, you know, uh, Leviticus 26, being worked out, really, literally, in their history, stretched out and worked out. Um, and then, you know, uh, Paul is saying this. Look, Hosea said that. That's what's happening now. You've been all kicked out. You came back. And most of the Jews that have come back, even they came back, see? Now that so few have accepted the gospel, they're saying, what's happening? Has the word of God failed? No. Is God unjust? No. What is the answer? Why? Paul is saying, chapter 9. Look, you're going through the prophetic process. And then Isaiah says what? Look, verse 28. It's very interesting. This is a key verse. Chapter, uh, verse 28. See? Uh, uh, you know, 27. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. Do you think church is also remnant? Yeah. Not all who call church are? Church. Now, that doesn't mean that we should get out of church. <laughs> it means that we got to be the true church. Just because there are a lot of sinning Jews, you don't actually get out of Jewish race. But you, the only option to re respond is to be the true Jew, inwardly. So the church is facing this. But verse 28, For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because God will make a short work upon the earth. Did you hear that? Many Christians hear it for the first time. God says he will do a short work or he will do a quick work. What does that mean? You know, the, all the prophetic scriptures. You look at Daniel 11, Daniel 12. You look at Zechariah 12, 13, 14. You look at Isaiah's, you know, uh, you know uh, different verses, uh, you know, uh, end time verses. Many of them, Hosea, um, you know, we've done a lot of study through all of that, there are tons of events there that needs to take place to bring Israel back into salvation and end the history with the preaching of the gospel to the ends of the earth. God says, in the end, see, it'll be very slow, very slow, and suddenly all the promises will be squashed in a short period of time. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 24, this generation, he really has one generation in mind whereby so much of the prophetic scriptures promise will be quickly fulfilled. Quickly, it will just fly. And suddenly you will find, oh, all that God promised, it just happened. Just happened, just happened, just happened. Bang, bang, bang. Especially, I want to, uh, you know, uh, at this point, read, I guess, um, Zechariah 12. Just a few verses, what will happen to Israel. Um, there are a lot of things that are happened, written politically, but spiritually, what will happen to the people in Zechariah 12, verse 10? This is uh, something that we've been praying a lot. He says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, whom they pierced. How, you know, Jews are still, they, they can't handle this. <laughs> They pierced me, God, Yahweh. How can you pierce God? It's because God became man, Jesus Christ. That's why they pierced his hands and feet. 
and his signs. This is a clear prophecy of uh, a cross. But suddenly, they will just begin to uh, see the revelation of it. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourn for his son and grieve for him as one grieve for his firstborn. In that day, there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning and headed women in the plain of Megiddo, and so on and so forth. And uh, there will be spiritual cleansing such as have never taken place since the inception of the nation of Israel until this day. Wow. You know, there's so much idolatry, all kinds of different spirit there right now. God says, I'm going to just cleanse them. It'll happen. It will happen. And we are privileged privilege to live in that generation. I believe our, our eyes will see your prayers and our prayers will be part of that, uh, bringing that to fulfillment. Amen. And then Isaiah says, Again, see, unless the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been like Gomorrah. Wow. Saying, if God didn't show mercy, see, it's not the, what, what they uh, uh, write. If you've gone by, if God gave them what they deserve, what Jews deserve, what Israel deserve, according to their response and faithfulness to God, the whole Israel would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah, whole. What is Sodom today? It's just an ash at the bottom of uh, you know uh, Dead Sea, all gone. Why? Because that's where the word sodomy comes from. That's where the homosexual practice and violence has been uh, overtaken the whole city. Israel would have been exactly like that. So Paul is saying that God has reserved remnant according to his grace and mercy. And uh, they will, um, you know, uh, they will fulfill all that God has promised. So look ahead, Paul is saying, don't accept this kind of a replacement thinking, saying that God's word has not failed. God's faithfulness has not, been, not failed. And it doesn't mean God is not, uh, God is unjust. God is very just. In fact, it's not the justice we want. It's God's mercy that's actually keeping Israel right now. And it's God's mercy that's keeping the church right now. Right now. And that mercy will continue on. And then whole Israel will turn. And uh, chapter 11, we go into more detail. But this is uh, Paul's outlook. Absolutely important. Absolutely, absolutely important. And chapter 9 Paul really focuses on God's sovereignty. Now, um, he's answering these two questions. Then how come Israel, God's people, are not, you know, the, the, most of the church in, in, in Rome are, are Gentiles now? How, how, how come? And how come uh, most of the people responding gospel at the time are more Gentiles than Jews? So Paul's answering in chapter 9, well, God's mercy and wrapped in God's sovereign choice. God's choice, God's sovereign, you know, choice, God's sovereignty. That's the first part of the answer. But chapter 10 talks about human part of responsibility. And you don't just put one over the other. They both work together. Now, Paul comes down to the nuts and bolts of why Israel failed. Why Israel failed. Even though God has chosen them, God has blessed them, God has made this promise, and God will never depart from their promise. Why is it right now in this time point in history, most of Israel has fallen away? Why? What is the human factor? That's what Paul is saying for the rest of chapter 10. And this is, unfortunately, I only got 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> to start. But uh, we will um, read just maybe just, can we uh, read or should I just stop? Can we read just a little bit? Yeah, just go a little bit further. Okay, now, so both parts are now are very important. Chapter 9, Paul is saying God's choice is more important and he's absolutely uh, establishing God's role, God's choice, but now here is man's choice, Israel's choice. 
Israel's responsibility in, uh, in rejecting God. And that's what happened. That's why there's a hardening come. Verse 30, present condition of Israel. What then? Shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? This is a burning question. Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling block and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Chapter 10, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteousness to everyone who believes. This is so loaded. So powerful. He's recapturing everything about the gospel. But he, he's now, Romans chapter 1 to 8, all the work that Paul had done, he's now applying it to the present condition of Israel from man's responsibility. Okay, what is the man's responsibility? Okay, Israel's response to God. See, Jews are the only people group on earth that sought to be right with God. But they missed it. And Gentiles who are not seeking to achieve righteousness of God, nor do they have strong concept, but they have attained it. What a sad paradox to the Jews. And Paul says even more, he is, boy, I, you know what? I feel like if I were a Jew, I feel the anger to actually stone Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the way Paul actually speaks, I, no wonder he, um, he aroused such anger and persecution. He says, on Jewish side, I'll give you this. You have a zeal. You have a religious, religious zeal. You have good intention. You have sincerity. You have a zeal. That's not enough. Good intention never saved anybody. Zeal never saved anybody. Sincerity never saved anybody. There are plenty of sincere people in many different religions. But their sincerity and religious zeal doesn't get you right with God. It doesn't save you. Never has it saved anybody ever in the history. Why have Jews failed? Because they saw God not according to knowledge. Paul says they were ignorant of God's ways. And I can just imagine, you know, Jews cringe you know these rabbis people who the, the pride of the jews is that they know god's ways chapter two right they want to instruct all these gentile uh people walking in darkness you know um this is the last thing this this is the thing that jews hate to be told the most and paul is saying you know what you are zealous You've got good intention. You, you have zeal, religious zeal, um, all that. But you know what? You're ignorant of God's ways. Your zeal is misdirected. You do not know God's way, but you found your own way. And because of that, you failed. See, Gentiles have been willing to receive God's righteousness by faith. Israel tried to earn it by observing a law, but they failed. You know, here are two key words of Israel's failure. Number one, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. Not submitted. Number two, they seek to establish their own righteousness. That's the root problem. What is the root problem? It is self-righteousness. What is the self-righteousness? It's the expression of the hidden condition of human sickness, pride. Pride. And that's why they crucified Messiah. And Jesus Messiah, Jesus Christ, become Israel's stumbling block. 
stumbling block instead of being the rock of salvation. Can you imagine, I want you to imagine a huge boulder at a fast pace of huge rushing flood water coming in and you find the boulder. What are you going to do? God says, you want to be safe from this flood of judgment? You need to grab hold of that boulder and you stand on top of the boulder, you will not be disappointed. You will never be swept away by the flood of judgment. You're safe. But if you say, I don't want to rely on this boulder. I want to swim out. I want to swim across. I want to swim with my own strength and, and be saved. What will happen? You get crushed by the boulder through the flood water. You either get saved by it or get crushed by it. You grab onto it, stand on it, you are absolutely secure. You rely on it, you stand on that boulder to save you. But if you want to try to swim, because you're a good swimmer, you want to work for it, you want to establish your own righteousness and not submit to God's way, then you'll be dashed by it. And he says, Israel, you chose to be dashed by this boulder. This rock that God wants you to stand on has become a stumbling block. You get dashed. Why? Because you do not submit to God's righteousness, which means destruction of your human pride of what you can do. But because you're zealous, you're sincere, but that's misdirected zeal. You do not submit to God. You do not look for God the way of faith and trust for what God has done. You get crushed under it. Israel, you're getting crushed right now. But that's not forever going to be that way. Amen. I want to uh, keep going. But uh, again, you know, uh, the, one of the bad things is I break in the middle of a session. Last week, I had to stop in the middle. So I uh, just uh, repick it up. Uh, anyway, uh, again, I can't finish it. Um, but the hour is gone. So I better stop here and pick it up again. Because Paul now, uh, chapter 10, he really gives it. And then he gives uh, the future uh, as well. And uh, he really goes for it. Uh, 10 and 11, absolutely crucial because Paul gets the crux of human responsibility. And how then do, uh, does a man get saved? How do you get saved? How do you stand, practically, actually st take hold of the rock and step on it so that you're saved? How? Very easy. It's not too hard. And Paul gives the principle of how you get saved. How do you apply Christ into your heart? And this chapter has been responsible for prayer of salvation more than any other. More people saved through these words, next few verses that we've just read. And this chapter is also responsible for sending more missionary than any other parts of the Bible. Amen. More people have been sent out to foreign nations uh, over a sheep over three months, and many of them didn't make it, but they still went. Why? Because they heard this chapter and Paul's heart, man's responsibility and God's choice coming together. And we are part of that link. We are co workers. I'm going to close it with uh, once again, uh, you know, that. That, that uh, verse 22, um, you know, and uh, also the uh, first Timothy. Let me just uh, read to you first Timothy. You know, um, saying, Are you a, a vessel that you have been? set aside, being cleansed. You know, if we actually um, cleanse ourselves, guess what? We'll all be the vessel of honor. Because in the house of God, there are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. There are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. 
But if we cleanse ourselves to be ready for the use of the Master, all of us will be vessels of honor, all of us, and the vessel of God's glory. Amen. Amen. Let me just pray, and then I'm going to um, just end it here. So praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We are all the vessels, Lord. Lord, we thank you. You have chosen us. The fact that we are Christ people searching the scriptures right now means that you have actually chosen us. You have chosen us. We could have never chosen you. You chose us to be the vessel of honor. And we want to respond the right way. Lord, as we looked at uh, chapter 9, Father, your word says you're going to quickly fulfill the last day prophetic program through your people, your church, and also that includes salvation of the Jews. We do pray, Lord. Lord, not out of uh, human sympathy, but out of your prophetic scriptures. Lord, your grace is wonderful. They, as well as us, We've fallen short of the grace of God. We've been disobedient. But Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness and kindness, your mercy. Hallelujah. We depend on your mercy. And Father, we stand on the rock, the Christ, this rock, Christ. Let it destroy and end all human pride, our endeavor, our, our seeking, to establish our own righteousness. Let it dash to pieces that we may stand on this rock of salvation boldly. We are saved through Jesus by believing in Jesus, not by trying and doing our good work. We receive your grace, your salvation, Jesus. You are the King. You're the Son of God. You've died for my sin and our sin. You raised back to life on the third day. And you're alive today to hear our prayer. Lord, we just offer our lives. May our lives be for your glory. In Jesus' name.